Welcome to Build, I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest, Justin Sayer, has been described as Oscar Wilde meets Whoopi Goldberg. He's written for Two Broke Girls, he was on one of the best shows of all time, Lisa Kudrow's The Comeback, and his book, Pretty, is coming out on paperback this month. You can see the second installment of his one-man show, The Gay BCs, on June 2nd and 3rd at the Public Theater. Let's take a look at a clip. I would like to preface it so I don't get letters. This is just my opinion. A is for ABBA. Oh my God. You really thought I was gonna start with AIDS, did you? A is for After Dark Magazine. A is for Edward Albee. A is also for addiction. As I've defined it, something in about five years or so your friends will all realize they have and then get real preachy about yours. A is also for age. A is for act up. B is for James Baldwin. My problem with BDSM is I'm like, is this done yet? Are you still a puppy or can we just talk about the dishes and bills? B is also for the daughters of Belitis. I wish lesbians had a magazine today. I'd read it. There'd be articles like, do your taxes in March. B is for black girls. Because we've stolen all their culture. B is for brunch. C is for Chaz Bono. Camp. What is it? They're all shares! That share! That share! That share! That share! I know when that aired originally, some little gay boy was like, just came. Wait, okay. Old movies, we get it. Talk about dicks again. C is for Joan Crawford. C is for Hart Crane. C is for Crisco, an honest baking product <laughs> that when you see it in a gay refrigerator, you're like, oh, shit. D is for daddy. D is for de profundis. D is for dildo. When you die, that's the one thing nobody's gonna take out of your apartment. D is also for this program. <laughs> Dynasty. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, literally, it's the best way to explain white privilege to your friends who don't get it. Sit them down in front of an episode of Dynasty and go, and just lean over at certain moments and go, a lot of this can happen because they're white. F is for felching. F is also for fetish. F is for Tom of Finland. Gay cartoons that used to appear in little pornographic magazines, but now you can get them on your sheets. I imagine they speak in very gay voices. Oh my God, is he gonna pick up that hammer? Oh my God. Where did I put my keys? G is for gagging, which in our community always means something good. G is also for gangbang. When you get that many men in a room together, there's a lot of yelling and I don't care for it. I have masturbated to the work of Allen Ginsberg. G is also for glory hole. I'd like the dick and not all the person. I wanted to have a moment where I was in a room of people just getting it together. And it's so nice to stand in front of you and get it with you all night. Everybody, please put your hands together for Justin Sayer. Thank you so much. Thank you. I didn't realize it was so blue. I was like, oh my God, she's playing the late night show, apparently. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I know it's I loved early. it. Were you, were, you, were you uncomfortable sitting next to it? A little bit. I was like, wow, that's filthy. Yeah. That is filthy for three o'clock in the afternoon. All right. One. Yeah. We're at one right now. I know, it's, it's, I know. Well, early. I'm on a different timeline, just of my own making, not on, yeah. Well, well, yeah, that's uh, where I am. So the second part of the show is yes. coming ju June second and third at at Joe's Pub. Yeah. When did this whole show start coming together for you? The first part and the second part. When did you start thinking about this? Um, I I was. Well, I had done a show in New York for about uh, eight years called The Meeting, which was a monthly comedy variety show. Uh, where we celebrate different gay icons and we had all kinds of Broadway and downtown performers kind of interpret their work and do crazy stuff like that. And because of that, I kind of uh, was talking, I was kind of always making work in concert with other artists. And what ended ha happening 
over the past few years, I would always get these letters from younger gay people and they'd be like, I don't know anything about gay culture. What could I, where could I find, is there a book somewhere? Is there something? And I was like, there, there kind of is, there kind of isn't. So I thought, really? well, what? Well, there isn't, there isn't like a how to be gay that book. Is true. There is not a how to be gay book. But I mean, you know, there, yeah. I mean, there's some rudimentary things I could do. <laughs> like other people that are like you, you know, and something simple. But um, so I thought, well, why not do it? Why not really kind of just have an evening where you go through stuff and you, you show clips to people and you kind of present things that maybe they haven't seen or people they don't know about um, and make it a show. So I, I thought, all right, I'm going to do this. And I, I wrote the first two shows and they were, you know, People really liked them. People really got into it. And so now it's five parts and it's becoming a book next year. So it's all, so there will be a book eventually. Congratulations. Can, thank you that. very much. Uh, what was your first exposure to gay culture that you, or that you self, you noticed? You were like, oh, okay, I get this. Sure. Well, I, <laughs> I think I, I grew up a lot, I hung out with my grandmothers a lot. And there it is. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's probably it. That's probably, it's why I always carry gloves and talk like I'm little Edie Beale. So um, uh, I, I, I think I saw something like Auntie Mame the first time, and I was like, I'm a little too into this. I'm a little, I am looking forward to how she changes the furniture from scene to scene a little too much. So yeah, I think th that was one of the things that I was immediately like, oh, I'm, this is, this is touching something very special within me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was probably the first thing I, I think I remember that I thought, oh, I get this. Yeah. And so when you started putting uh, the gay BCs together, a brief history of gay culture in, in five parts, what did you start with? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I wanted, the, the idea overall was that it wouldn't just be a list of people, but it would be a list of activities and events and and things that were shaping, that shape a culture. Um, and, then I, and then I also knew that, you know, gay queer culture is, it encompasses a lot of different people. So it wasn't just going to be kind of, you know, Broadway people that, you know, it, it was gonna be people that make dance music in the 90s and people that were making theater in the 70s and it was gonna, and, and you know, pop stars, Today, it was going to try to gr see a through line through this culture that had been made ac across generations and across kind of identities. And um, so it was really just kind of culling everything together and making these long, long lists of, okay, well, we're we can talk about her, we can talk about him, we can, you know, and, and trying to make it as varied and interesting as possible. So that's that's oh, that was kind of always the... And, and actually doing it in alphabetical order just helped me kind of be like, okay, well, I have, now I got through my A's, I gotta get through my B's, you know? And so five parts, what, how far did you get into the alphabet in the first part? The first part, so the first night I did A through D, and then the second night I did <laughs> that E like through That is like two hours? H. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, it was, and at a certain point I was telling the audience, stop laughing, we have to move. <laughs> you know, I was just like, we have to keep going. We have so many people. But um, yeah, so to, on Saturday night, I do I through L, and then Sunday night, I do M through Q. Wow. And yeah. When do we get uh, P through... Uh, the rest. Yeah. Uh, next year. Next year. Next year when the book comes out. So do you have those written yet, or are you still so, sort of still working your way through? I, I have... I have everything that I'm doing this weekend written. That's, that's as much as I can promise you. I'm working on the book, uh, and I, I'm working through, I, you know, the, the great thing about the book is there's a, there's a time limit in a show that you, there are people that, you know, you can't do, so you kind of have to pick and choose, okay, who's, who can we, you know, make and, and, and see in the show, but... Uh, with the book, I have a, an expanded catalog that I can put in people that I didn't get to cover in the in the show. So that's a really nice feature of that. Do you have a favorite moment in time or piece of queer culture that you hold on to the most, or, historically speaking? Yeah. I mean, I think I think what is 
I, I, I think for me, the thing that I'm, I miss a lot, and I think the thing I think about a lot in a, in a moment in queer culture is the, the late 70s, mm-hmm. especially in New York, because there were a lot of different people making a lot of different kinds of art. And, and they were really exploring a lot of things that were, that even today would be progressive and, and would be, you know, way out there. Um, but they were doing it with a, a, a great sense of humor and they were asking big questions about what it is not only to be a queer person, but to be an American person at that moment. Um, and I think that kind of got sidetracked by the AIDS crisis. The most obvious example of this would be like Robert Maplethorpe or something. Robert right? Maplethorpe, people like Charles Ludlam, people like Ethel Eichelberger. I mean, those were those were folks that when I was coming up in New York were kind of legends, but kind of foggy legends who who were all gone by the time that I had come to New York. So it was, I when I think about that time, I kind of, I long for those people and wish there was a stronger connection because I think I, I missed out on a lot of, you know, transference, of artist transference that I would have had if I'd been around then. It's interesting that you say sidetracked by the AIDS crisis because there is a sense of all of this sort of developing work and developing tone that suddenly becomes all encompassed by this tragedy. Rightfully so, sure. but at the same time, as you said, sort of sidetracked, I think, uh, a lot of the big questions that were being asked by the art prior to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the you look at stuff that was being written in, like, 1979, 1980. People were asking big questions about polyamory and what and, and different kind of relationships that, that folks were having. Having, you know, the radical fairies in Harry Hay got invented in 1979, where they were talking about a queer spirituality for the first time in America. And then AIDS happened, and it was a plague, and, and so many people were dying so quickly that they were just kind of trying to hold on. And it also forced a kind of political reinforcement of the uh, monogamous sort of... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I don't know how to put this. Uh, the... Uh, the monogamous sort of like gay white man representation as much as possible. Everything else became quite fearful and pushed aside. Oh, sure. Sure. And, and I mean, there was like a redemption kind of story that kind that had to happen. We'd been wrecked, you know, the, the narrative was, Oh, we'd been reckless in the seventies and we paid for it in the eighties. None of that was true, but that certainly kind of came out. And now, you know, we all have, we're going to adopt kids and have, you know, all that life. All I still wear it. Very a, nice. Very nice, but I'll still be in a dress, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that'll be me. Have you ever had, uh, obviously it's, it's a celebration of, of, of gay culture, but gay yeah. culture can mean so many different things to different sure. people. Have you ever had um, uh, conversations about, uh, about the work where someone was not necessarily offended, but sort of took, took issue with anything about oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, people take, I mean, people get mad when people get left out. Yeah. They feel like, oh, well, why didn't you put this person in? And, and I, I feel like I've created a tone with my audience, hopefully, where I can hear those things and I'm not mad about it. I don't feel attacked. I'm like, oh, I get that. That's fair. Well, I think of like the BDSM joke, which oh, I, sure. I, I love and totally relate to, to yeah. be honest with you. But I think it's one of those things where any kind of marginalized voice oh. feels like they should, like, you know, that their world should be represented and celebrated. Yeah. Versus, yeah. Well, I mean, the, tr- the truth of the thing is, it, I, and I say this at the, I preface every show with this, that it is my opinion. Yeah. I'm the one talking, so it's my opinion. And, and always that, with that stuff, the joke's on me. Like, if you get into BDSM and that's what you like, mazel. Yeah. Enjoy it. I'm so happy. I am so white bread. I want to sit home and listen to, like, you know, Johnny Mathis records and cuddle. That's all I want. So, you know, if you're living life and enjoying it, being peed on, do whatever you want. Enjoy your life. I don't care. But for me, I'm like, mm, I'd rather eat Chinese food. So would I, but I still have that feeling of like, oh God, that must be cool to be kinky. Good for you. But then I'm like, uh, that seems like that. so much work. That seems it like does. so much work. It seems like too much work and it also seems like too much accessories to buy. Yeah. Like I would rather buy a book or a scarf than be like, oh, I have to buy a harness today. No, thanks. Too much conversation too during. Too much. Yeah. Too much. But again, no. if you're into it, please. Oh, enjoy. As I say in the show all the time, I don't want to yuck your yum. If you like it, if you enjoy it, enjoy it. 
know that I am an old stick in the mud and a little old lady in my house. That's fine. <laughs> but, you've been yeah. a, uh, a cabaret performer and comedian for yes. how long now? Oh, God, probably about 10 15 years, I guess, yeah. And just a few years ago, or maybe five or six years ago, you were writing on Two Broke Girls. A, yeah, about three, three a, and a half years ago. A yeah, sitcom. Four. What was it like making that transition? Well, it kind of, it happened out of nowhere. Uh, Michael Patrick King, who did Sex and the City and The Comeback, saw my show in New York and said, have you ever thought about writing for television? And I said, no, I hadn't. <laughs> And he said, I well, like money. Yeah, I said, no, I hadn't. He said, well, would you think about it? I said, sure, I will. Uh, so I went out having no idea what it was like uh, in any way and uh, really studied hard to figure out what it is. And it's, especially doing a show like Two Broke Girls, which is in front of a live studio audience, I think that was a great transition into television writing because I was able to understand, oh, well, they didn't get that joke, we'll try a new one. You know, there was that performative aspect to it. Um, but it was, it was great, and I really liked the pace of it. I, I love that it's, you know, the thing that I often, I work a lot, and the thing that I would often sometimes get frustrated with in New York is, you know, you work on a play for a year and a half, and then you do a reading of it. And then you're kind of, you know, like, the, 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 the pace of it is so different because the real estate is so hard to kind of get anything accomplished. Where, you know, you have a week to write a script, and you gotta write, and you're gonna do 28 jokes, and you're gonna get it done, and, and that pace is Is, it, is a script generally consi consistent of 28 jokes? Is that 20? <laughs> Wouldn't that be, I should write that book and be like, it's only 28 jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, some TV, kind of cheat. TV writing, it's yeah. only 28 jokes. 28 jokes. No, but that's, I mean, after like being TV. on a sitcom like that for so long, uh, you do think, I just think of it, it's like, oh, this scene's, what is it, nine jokes? All right, we'll just come, come on, move but the story along. I go. imagine doing that, the exercise of writing that much every week and the setup punch of a, of a sitcom every week really affected your playwriting as well. Oh, absolutely. And probably strengthened it in a lot of ways. Yeah, because you're just... I mean, that's, I, when, I, when I talk to people about the things that I'm working on, they're like, you're so prolific. And I'm like, because I've now been through a rigor of yeah. you write, you know, a certain amount every single, single day. So, yeah, I, I write a lot because of it. And I think it has strengthened that because I just, yeah, it has to be clear and out and done. And also, the more you write, the more ideas you get to keep writing and to yeah. for other projects. Sometimes oh, it can absolutely. be almost overwhelming. You're like, oh, I've got to put these things away yeah. so I can focus on this thing. I do well I, to do to combat that. I record it. I give myself a night, and I, I tell everybody this is the trick to do it. If you really con if you con have a brilliant idea that night, turn on your phone, record it, talk it all out, get it all out, and then put it away. So that you don't lose it, you don't lose, and you also don't lose that enthusiasm for it. But then you can go back to work on whatever you have to do. Oh, that's great! I will. Yeah, I'm, going, I'm going to pocket that. Thank it's a you. tremendous. It's it's really been a gift. So you're also a novelist. I am. You have three y, uh, YA novels. Yes. What made you decide to start writing YA? How did that they, happen? They wrote me a check, and I. <laughs> No, uh, Michael and, Patrick King. No, no. It's like, have you ever thought in, about writing YA? No, <laughs> and I was like, no, I haven't. No, um, in a in in a very true way, uh, my friend had written the gay uh, a gay version of Mad Libs, and they were doing an event for it. And he said, "Will you come and do a Mad Lib and be funny for five minutes?" And I said, "Sure, I will." And I went and I was funny for five minutes. And his editor from Penguin was there and said, "Justin's really funny. Has he ever thought about writing?" for YA and I, so they called me and said, would you ever think about it? And I said, sure, I'll do it. I don't know anything about it. I've never written a book. life is just a series of discoveries. Yeah, I'm like, oh, no, I think I could do that. Like, I, and, and it's, it, it, there's a foolhardiness to it. Like, I have, this, I have this idea right now that if RuPaul walked in the door and said, I need you to be on Drag Race, I could win it. And I have no, I can't make a dress, I can't beat my, I can do nothing, but I'd be like, I bet I could do it. I bet if put down. So yeah, when they said, can you write a YA novel? I was like, yeah, all right, I'll try. So I wrote one and then they signed me to two more and, and the, uh, the third one comes out next year and uh, Pretty, the second one, uh, comes out this month in paperback, yeah. Oh. Was it yeah. difficult writing these books? No. Really? No. Because it's really, 
I mean, the thing, I didn't really read a lot of YA novels when I was a kid. I read, my grandmother read a lot of like celebrity biographies and left them around the house. So <laughs> those were the books we had. So as a kid, I, you know, wrote term pay, like book reports on Lana Turner, my story. And you know, like, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to write about Ava Gardner this week. Um, so I didn't really know. But what it was, was just kind of tapping into... <clears throat> I think we're all kind of 12 year olds. We just have better impulse control. Mm -hmm. So if you turn that down and you're really honest about how you feel in moments to moment, that's, that's exactly what it was like then. But you're just, you've learned how to control yourself and handle yourself a little bit better. And the books in that way were just kind of dealing with, I didn't, I didn't want to talk down to kids. I didn't want to you know, kind of spin them a yarn. I wanted to really just talk about what their lives were like. And, uh, and so far, that's been effective. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't have a tough time with it. I was just like, oh, here's the story, and we just go through it. I, How much do you write a day? Uh, I probably write about six hours a day. For real? Yeah. Six hours, and is that like a time limit that you give you, or is that just what you end up doing? Uh, I break it up, and I do about three and three. Okay, so like three in the morning, go for a walk or do something, and yeah. then three, three later in the afternoon. Yeah, or three at, uh, well, usually about four at night. I like to write at night. Four in the morning or four in the afternoon? Like, like 4 p.m.? 10, 10 p.m. till about 2 a.m. I love to write. Yeah, everyone's kind of asleep, leaving you yes, alone. Yes, and it's quiet. Because even in the day, especially when you're writing at home, you know, there's garbage trucks and people running by and birds at night. <laughs> birds. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm mad about birds. I'm a crazy old lady. Birds. Um, but, yeah, no, at Shut night up. it's quiet. Shut up, you birds. You know, but at night it's very, very quiet. And, uh, yeah, I like to write at night. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, now that you've gotten to work on stage, on television, and in literature, like which one of those do you prefer doing? Well, I still, I have to say, I still really love the stage. Um, I'm actually, uh, so I do, I do this show now, and then I come back in September with a new show called Justin Sayer Makes the Case for America, uh, which is, I'm really excited about. I really like the stage because I think especially now, it's so important to kind of sit in a room and make something with people. Even just kind of make an atmosphere and, and connect with people. It, it, it moves people now in a way that's totally different because, you know, everybody's watching something on their phone. Everybody's kind of always connected. So to, to be in another person's presence and see them work and process something, I think is really important. That being said, I re I'm, I'm writing a new book and I'm really excited about it, but um, I'm glad I get to do all of them, but I think always it'll be the stage that I'm always kind of thrilled about. The stage in the theater is really the only place right now where people get legitimately mad at others for turning their phones on and having yeah. their phone ring. Like, you can go to a movie theater and I get mad, but you can tell not everybody's that mad that no. someone's tweeting or something. It bothers me, but the theater, it's where it's really like, you will get thrown out of here. Oh, absolutely. Again, which is... Yeah. A wonderful experience. Oh, to I went. I saw once on this island while I was here two days ago, and this woman's phone went off when when they were really in a passionate scene, and I was like, "You should be killed," <laughs> and she shouldn't be killed. She probably just forgot. But I was like, "How dare you?" I saw the Iceman cometh last night, oh. and uh, it was incredible. Incredible. I, I get that it's tough for a lot yeah. of people. It's a four-hour Eugene O'Neill play, but you know. The last act, Denzel Washington gives this like 20 minute monologue where he sits yeah. at the front of the stage. There was someone snoring louder than I've ever heard in oh my, my entire God. life. Sitting like in the, I was on the mezzanine, yeah. they were sitting like in the middle of the orchestra and in the midst of this beautiful monologue you would hear. Oh yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable, I couldn't, yeah. I was like, how does someone like Denzel Washington get through? Yeah. How do they not just go? No. And just throw them out. Well, it's, you know, it's, I just did, Taylor, do you know Taylor Mack? Familiar. Yeah, Taylor Mack is a is a is an artist that I've known for a long time, and he did a 24 hour concert of oh, American yeah. music, yeah. and he brought it to L.A. and I was part of it in L.A. and he says that's the art in the room. You have to pay attention to the art in the room, and you make art as a theater performer in concert with your audience. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you're getting, 
you got to use it. You got to participate with it in some way. So, so it's really changed. That was a huge kind of shift in my mind to think about those things of like, okay, this is what's in the room. This is what we're going to play with. This is, you know. Well, it keeps you alive, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And it keeps, you, uh, it, it keeps you moving away from the idea that this is a sort of stayed, stiff idea that I, cre yeah. I came up with six months ago and I keep doing it every night. Yeah, and I think, I mean, and that's the thing that I love about the theater and even a, a situation like this, like you're creating a situation because you're being present with each other and, and there are less and less opportunities in the modern world where we're really asked to be present with each other. So, yeah. I mean, and that's what I, I really enjoy. One more. Hi. Hi. Um, we're going to take our last question from an online viewer. Sure. Paul wants to know, is there any advice you have for young writers when it comes to writing their truths? Um, <clears throat> well, I, the thing I would say is always, it's, I always think of this Diane Arbus quote, um, who was a photographer, a very famous photographer, and she said, uh, the more specific you make it, the more general it can become. So I think that when you are writing, don't ever think like, oh, I have to make this appeal to everybody. You have to make it as true and as sincere and as passionate about the subject matter that it can be. And out of that, there, you will touch on universal truths that will connect to people. I mean, I've written things. I wrote a play a couple of years ago about uh, fairy bars in the 1890s, and it was really a play about love. And, and, and you know, the references were totally different, but but uh, the connection and what the, the truth was was so present in there. And I think that's what great art do, hopes to do, is really kind of make that connection past the, this, you know, you're trying to touch on something really human. And if you can do that, that's always important. But you only do that by telling your absolute truth. So don't shy away from it. Don't tiptoe around it. Don't try to make it palatable. Just write exactly what you want to write. What's the kind of cliche thing that people say about writing plays that characters really only want like five things and that yeah. there's really only three different types of scene <laughs> scenes and if you can tell you can make a story about anything but you're always going to to make it entertaining and to make it emotional for people you're generally always going to come back to the five different things that people oh, want in the three different types of scenes. Yeah. No, it's it's absolutely I mean it's true. It's true, you're just looking for a way, you're looking for an interesting way to talk about big questions. We're still talking about, you know, you go back to the Greeks or all of literature, and we're still talking about the same things. What does it mean to be in love? What does it mean to be loyal? What does it mean to be a, a mother or a father in the world? Uh, what does it mean to fear death? You know, all those big questions, we're still asking them. But your character, you write this play uh, about bars in the 1890s, you yeah. said? Yeah, uh -huh. First scene, your first character, your 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 main character. What did they want in that scene? What I think they just wanted to sleep. <laughs> that's a thing. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a thing. That they just wanted to sleep, which is un understandable. <laughs> that's yeah, like a perfect theatrical thing. Let me sleep. Yeah, no, please. I just want to please. I just want to sleep sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no. I think I think that's the thing I would always say. And and don't, you know, there's a lot of. The other thing is, I would say, and to answer this question, and I say this really sincerely, don't ever feel like you have to explain anybody to anybody else. Because I think that's where people get into a lot of trouble. I think a lot of sometimes gay art especially, they try to, ex oh, I'm going to explain what gay life is to you. That's not your job or your obligation. Just tell your story and we'll catch up. Yeah. Um, well, Justin, it's been a pleasure talking. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much it's been so here. nice to talk to you. Um, gay BCs, a brief history of gay yes. culture in five parts. Parts Part two and three, part three and four. Three and four. Are going to be at the public on June 2nd and 3rd. Yes. Pretty in paperback is coming out June 23rd. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. I'll say yes. And I'm in the no fall, you are going to make a case for America. I'm going to make the case for America. I yes. I can't wait. Please come down. Justin, say everybody. Let's Thanks hear it. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>